Ezra and Nehemiah's reforms can be seen as a direct response to the events of Israel's history. What's happened before just cannot be allowed to happen again. And they view the tragic history as a cautionary tale. It's calling upon the people to make the necessary changes to avoid a repeat disaster. There's only one way to guarantee that Israel will never again be destroyed. She has to live up to the covenant she failed to honor in the past. She has to rededicate her, herself to the covenant, and this time she has to be single-minded in her devotion to God because history has shown that God will punish faithlessness and betrayal. Israel can't be led astray by the beliefs and practices of her neighbors, and so a strict policy of separation has to be enforced if Israel's going to finally be cured of the desire for idols. And again, it's interesting that in Jewish tradition, the Jewish tradition is that the flirtation with idolatry, which had plagued Israel in the first temple period, ceased to exist in the second temple period. So again, this is another area in which Jews earn for themselves a reputation in antiquity. They have a reputation for their strict monotheism, their scrupulous avoidance of foreign gods. They will not bow down to another god. There is this people that doesn't intermarry. They don't work one day a week, and they won't bow down to our kings or to other gods. These are the kinds of things you find in, these, in writings in this period. But Ezra and Nehemiah backed by Persian imperial authority, helped to create and preserve, create and preserve, not just preserve, create and preserve a national and religious identity for Jews at a precarious time. Their reforms were not universally welcomed. Already, even in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which give a very sympathetic account of their work, obviously, we, we can see rumblings and, and discontent. There are other works that are going to express opposition to the separatism of Ezra and Nehemiah. Isaiah 56, verses 1 to 7, an interesting passage. It states quite explicitly that foreigners who have joined themselves to God are welcome. They are welcome in the temple. They are welcome even to minister before God. There's a good deal of historical evidence for the assimilation of foreigners within the Jewish community going on all the time. Non-Jews became Jews. They married Jews. And we know of one family, the Tobiad family, quite influential. They were originally an Ammonite family. Now, that is a group that is explicitly prohibited from entering the congregation in Deuteronomy. But this is a family that uh, adopted Jewish identity, became fully assimilated. So you know, clearly there's, there's, there's great difference of opinion on this matter. And in the last two lectures, we're going to be focusing a lot on the diversity of approaches to the whole question of Israelite Jewish identity and relationship to the Gentile world. So although under Ezra, the Torah became the official and authoritative norm for Israel, Although under Ezra, Judaism took the decisive step towards becoming a religion of scripture, you know, based on this scriptural text, this did not in itself result in a single uniform set of practices or beliefs. Adopting the Torah as a communal norm simply meant that practices and beliefs were deemed to be authentic to the degree that they accorded with the sense of scripture. An interpretation of scripture varied dramatically so that widely divergent groups now, in the Persian period and as we move into the Hellenistic period, widely divergent groups will claim biblical warrant for their specific practices and beliefs. So in short, Ezra may have unified Israel around a common text, but he didn't unify them around a common interpretation of that text. All right, when we come back, we'll be looking at about four more books, all of which set up very interesting and different views on some of these basic questions.